All right, well, good morning, everybody. The last two weeks, we've been reading one of my all-time favorite chapters, Romans 8. We've learned so far that the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. Okay? The mindset on the flesh brings death. Okay? But that when you are being controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit, instead, you have peace. And that you know that the Spirit is within you if you live a Spirit-controlled life. You know you're a believer if you are you're living a life that's controlled by the Spirit. And you have a desire to be more holy and obey the Lord. And we've also learned that the Spirit dwelling in us is a guarantee that we'll be resurrected as Christ was. That's a lot of good stuff to know, isn't it? Well, today we're going to continue our look at the wonderful Spirit of God that we were just singing to Holy Spirit. We welcome you here, that song, as we study some more of Romans 8. And uh, so let me pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word, that we're not just going on someone's opinion, some blog, or some, you know, somebody out there that has some good stuff, that we have the word that's living and active sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces bone and marrow, reveals our innermost motives and secrets, and then also guides us into peace and guides us into our mission that you've given us on life. Help us, Lord, to understand the word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, who has their owner's manual? Basic instructions before leaving earth. All right. So let's turn to Romans 8. I'm going to loop back and start with 11, where we stopped last week. <clears throat> if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So last week I dwelled on the resurrection, right? But there's there's also that immediate awakening of our mortal bodies today with the Holy Spirit in us. We have that now. So that leads me to your first point in your notes. If you don't have your notes, they're on the table in the back. The Spirit within us gives life to our mortal bodies. The Spirit within us gives life to our mortal bodies. We are dead in our sins before we meet Christ. We're dead in our sins. There's nothing you can do about it. Everybody on this beach right now, in this parking lot, in the water, that does not know Christ is dead in their sins, and they cannot get into heaven unless they put their faith in Jesus. And that is a sobering truth, isn't it? Doesn't that make you want to tell somebody? That's what I do. Just start with one person, right? The Holy Spirit draws us to God. We know that from John 6, 44 convicts us of our sin, okay, John 16, 8, and enables us to come to Him, John 6, 65. And when we repent, change our mind about how we're living and what we think about God and the Bible and Jesus, when we change our mind, we re- when we repent and are put our trust in Jesus, Acts 2, 38, okay, His Spirit comes to reside in us and we become born again, John 3, 3. Okay? The Spirit within us gives life to our mortal bodies. My body's feeling really mortal this morning. I'm kind of fighting a little cold and I'm tired from a long week and, you know, all that stuff. I'm feeling that weight, right, of the body. He wants to give life to me. I, I just prayed, Lord, fill me with your Spirit as I worship and help me preach. I prayed in the Spirit on the way over here, Lord, I can't do this without you. Give life to my mortal body. It gives us power also to say no to sin. How many said no to sin this week? Look at those hands. That's awesome. Good job, y'all. You get, and and how many feel better because you did? That's the point. We have more power now. We feel free in our hearts. Our conscience is, is, is not condemning us, right? Because the Holy Spirit within us It gives us power to do the right thing, power to obey, power to love, power to serve others, power to be a vessel for God, to bring healing, encouragement, mercy, forgiveness, love, hope, and to suffer 
knowing that one day we will rise again like Christ has and live with Him forever. You know, I want to tell you, yesterday morning, Friday morning, I was suffering because I went into my office with a nice big cup of coffee, set it down on the edge of my little coaster incorrectly, and it tipped over and spilled across my desk, under the glass, under, onto the copy paper, onto the power strip, and I had a lake of coffee and I needed to turn on my Zoom and my seven-year-olds were waiting for me, suffering. <laughs> but I must say, I was very calm. It was a miracle. I, I did not raise my voice. I went into the house. Honey, I need some rags. <laughs> now. <laughs> It was a huge mess. Oh my gosh, at least, it, at least it smells like coffee now. It could be much worse, right? But, you know, he even helps us in our suffering. And then obviously people around the world right now that are suffering in the na- for the name of Jesus and being persecuted in Afghanistan and Iran and Nepal and India and on and on and on and on. Because they know that one day they will rise again with Christ. That it's not over yet. And live with Him forever. Right now there are 16 missionaries that are held captive in Haiti. They're a group of Amish and Mennonites from the Ohio Bay Area. And they're then working, building buildings for these poor people and just serving. Giving their life to people in Haiti. And they got kidnapped by a gang and they're being held for ransom for a million bucks. And the gang leader said he's gonna start putting bullets through them. And there's like a six month old and a three year old and a seven, you know, it's a full family of believers. You know what their response was to that? From their group, their response was, we praise God for the opportunity to love our enemies. Whoa, woo, that's perspective. But we do need to pray for them because there are people like us and they're hurting, they're scared, right? And they're having to trust the Lord every minute right now. Let's pray that, you know, in the U.S., our policy is not to pay the ransom. Our policy is to use SWAT teams and try to rescue them. And it doesn't always work out. So be praying for them. We also praise God that the Spirit in us gives us uh, His presence, guides us, and leads us on paths of peace, to do His will. We know that from Isaiah 30, 21. As we go, we'll hear a still small voice saying, go to the right or go to the left. You'll feel His leading in your life if you are spending time with Jesus and getting quiet before Him. He'll speak through His Word. Psalm 32, 8 through 9 says that He'll teach us, instruct us, and show us the way to go. Acts 2, 28, which is our personal email, He shows us the paths of life and fills us with peace presence with joy in his presence he wants to speak through us words of wisdom and prophecy preach the word disciple and share our faith there's so much he wants to do through our mortal bodies and simply just love one another and they'll know that we're christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love right i went to uh, one of the dodger games not one of the good ones. They actually lost two to nine. But of all the people in the stadium, God put me next to a, a Braves fan who was a pastor from Atlanta. And he was afraid to go to the stadium, and he gave, God gave him me to sit next to. I said, no worries, we're good here. And so we had this great fellowship while we were getting shellacked. And... Um, I asked him, so how did you become a Christian? He said, well, when I was 18 in Atlanta, I I went to my, I was visiting my my brother's friends, and I've never seen people care for each other like that. And they were believers. I'd never seen that kind of love. Because guys in the world, they just put it, cut each other down. You can never trust each other. You know, it's just backbiting, whatever, you know. And girls too, obviously. But he said that their love for each other is what spoke to him and drew him into Christ. So just simply loving by the power of the Holy Spirit speaks volumes to a world in chaos. Amen? All this and more is done by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. 
that's a sermon in itself. We can just go home right now, right? But I'm not going to because there's a lot of Romans 8. It would take me months. So let's go to verse 12. So then, knowing that, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So knowing that the Holy Spirit is within us and has awakened our mortal bodies, Point number two, we are not obligated to live according to the flesh. Okay? We don't have to please the flesh. We're not obligated to make it happy. You ever feel sometimes like, I just have to do it because my flesh needs that in order for me to be okay? That's a lie. The J.B. Phillips Bible says we have no particular reason to feel grateful to our sensual nature or to live life on the level of the instincts. The New Living Translation says, Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. But we still rationalize, don't we? Oh, it's what my body needs. Well, is it according to Scripture? If it is, go ahead. If it's not, then don't do it. Don't you feel like you just have to give in and please your body to satisfy it? We'll hear these voices in our head or from another source online or some kind of, you know, podcast or some, somebody on TV like Oprah or somebody like that. Say you just, you have to feed your flesh like that so that it's going to be okay. It's just natural. Well, obviously, some needs need to be met, like ice cream. We need ice cream. No, but seriously, actually for some, that is a temptation itself that's leading people down the wrong road, right? We need food, though. That's food for thought. Unless you're fasting, which should be a part of every believer's life. And you can, my wife is a, she's the queen of fasting. It's incredible. She's not doing it to lose weight, I assure you. She does it so that chains are broken, so prayers are answered. Isaiah 58, 5 through 12 talks about a true fast. I encourage you to look at that. In Matthew 6, 16, 18 through 18, says, When you fast, don't go acting all somber and tell everybody I'm so, you know, I'm so miserable because I'm fasting, I haven't eaten, you know, like, then you lose you lose the whole point. You miss the whole point. You're supposed to just fast between you and the Lord, have a joyful face. But it says when you fast, not if, it says when you fast. And we do need to sleep and exercise. God will give us discernment and show us what is right and wrong. Although too much food and too much sleep isn't good either, isn't it? What we're talking about here is that when we're tempted to satisfy the sinful desires and the appetites of the flesh, these things come under many categories. And you know what they are if you're reading the Bible and you're being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You will know what you need to do. James 4, 17 says, whatever you know, that's right for you, and you do that then, that, then you're not sinning. But if you know things that you shouldn't do, and you do those things, then that's sin for you. There's a lot of gray areas, in the, aren't there? About how we spend our time with entertainment, and media, and clothing, and music, and all that. The Holy Spirit will lead you. And you'll have that, if you have that sensitivity, the Spirit within you will guide you. Because the whole goal is to be sanctified. We've been talking about that, to be more like Jesus. Because we can either learn it now or we can learn it later. Because we know in 1 John 3, it says we're going to be like Him. So we might as well just let Him get on with the program. Our true affection and desire should be for Christ Himself. That should be our greatest appetite. And I must confess, I have an appetite for many things. Case in point, surf. So when I go surfing, I always try to honor the Lord and talk to people about Jesus and thank Him for the surf. And, you know, it's all an attitude, isn't it? It's an attitude in life. Let's go to verse 13. Is this good stuff? Are you all encouraged? Okay, verse 13. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. I, I'm, I can hear one of those, those video games, you must die, you know, one of those voices, right? <laughs> if by the Spirit you're putting, it says, that if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death 
the deeds of the body, you will live. So, point number three. Living according to the flesh brings death. We are tempted to sin by our fleshly desires. We just talked about that. When we feel obligated to quench these desires and go through it, it brings death. When we want to satisfy these desires. Speaking of sin, a pastor once told his congregation, to help you understand my sermon, I want you all to read Mark 17. The following Sunday, the preacher asked who read it. With every hand going up, the preacher smiles and said, Mark has only 16 chapters. Now I will proceed with my sermon on the sin of lying. <laughs> so, here's a quote. If any habitually... If any habitually live according to corrupt lustings, they will certainly perish in their sins. Whatever they profess, even believing, whatever they profess. Let me say that again. If any people habitually live according to corrupt lustings, they will certainly perish in their sins, whatever they profess. Right? There's Christians out there that are backslidden and they're a mess. Their life's full of death. And what can a worldly life present worthy for a moment to be put against this noble prize of our high calling? Nothing. Has nothing on what we have. Here's another quote. There can be no safety, no holiness, no happiness to those who are out of Christ. Let me say that again. There can be no safety, no holiness... I heard a set. Anyway, no happiness to those who are out of Christ. No safety. Because all such are under the condemnation of the law, Romans 8.1. No holiness because such only as are united to Christ have the spirit of Christ, Romans 8.9. And no happiness because to be carnally minded is death that we've seen in Romans 8.6. I'll give you two cases in point. The first is uh, my friend, Pastor Guy Takashima, and he, gave, he told his testimony at Hope Chapel one year. But um, he was a Christian and on fire, right? Just loving the Lord, telling people about Jesus. And somehow he started smoking crack. I mean, seriously, I don't know how it happened, but he was a real comp- he's a real competitive guy. He's got a lot of energy. And so he said at one point he was smoking so much crack, he ended up in the basement of his house in the dark, in the corner, paranoid, and not even able to leave his house, and he was saved. Ouch. Death was upon his life. And he could have perished from smoking crack till he repented. And I met him at Ho Chapel when he was a steward. He helped set up chairs and clean the bathrooms. That was his way of getting restored back into ministry. And then after a period of time, he became a pastor of his own church, Coast, uh, Coast Christian, whatever. So it can happen to a believer. Thankfully, he turned around, right? Or another one, Lonnie Frisbee. If you go see the movie right now about the history of Christian music, and from the 60s and the 70s, Lonnie Frisbee was one of the, the guys that got the whole Jesus movement started. He was apparently naked on an acid trip in the desert and met Jesus. One of these hippie moments in the 60s and was on fire. I mean, on fire everywhere he went. Just people, like the hundreds getting baptized. If you look at the Jesus Revolution book and the story in the movie, incredible. And then years later, he fell into the gay lifestyle. Unbelievable. As a believer. And he did not repent, and he died of AIDS. Literally, death came into his life from setting his mind on the flesh. Unbelievable. He was an enormous figure in the Jesus movement. Enormous. Long hair, beard, looked like Jesus. Everybody loved him. He's charismatic. Unbelievable. We should all be careful, shouldn't we? 
So, and then that leads to point number four. After point number three, living according to the flesh brings death, point number four says, putting to death the deeds of the body brings life. Just the opposite. As you say no to these things and put them away, then you will receive life. By the way, I have other scriptures there that you can look up later that are really good, but because of time, I'm moving on. When we die to self, we become alive in Christ. This is not a one-time deal. This is a daily activity to choose to die to self. I remember Kate at one point on her surfboard wrote, uh, I pray that I may decrease and Jesus may increase in my life. When we do this, our whole disposition changes. Here's another quote. Let us then, by the Spirit, endeavor more and more to mortify the flesh. Put it to death. Just kill it, right? Regeneration by the Holy Spirit brings a new and divine life to the soul. How many know what I'm talking about? You're just different. You've got hope. Even when you're like, you know, I t Turquoise asked me how I was earlier. I said, I'm like 80% because I kind of have a cold. But I still have like lots of hope and lots to look forward to. And I got the Holy Spirit, you know. I'm just, you know, it's not 100 when we, have, when we turn our, our lives over to Jesus, it brings divine life to our soul. Although we are in this feeble state in our flesh, yet in that state, we become alive in Christ. So how do we do this? Point number five, receive the Holy Spirit. Mark 1.8 says that Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, okay? Look at uh, Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen 13 reads, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We need to ask for the Holy Spirit, Right? If you don't have the Spirit within you right now, and you know what I'm talking about, if you're listening, Jesus says, ask for it. Repent and put all your trust in the Lord. That's what it says in Acts 2.38. Look at Acts 2.38. It's right after 1 and right before 3. Acts 2.38 reads, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe in water baptism. You put your trust in Jesus, you surrender your life, you get baptized in water, and then He wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I already talked about how the Holy Spirit draws us, convicts us, and enables us to come to Him. That is already at act, act, it's already happening in our life. Then when we surrender to Jesus, we have this new, this new anointing of the Holy Spirit comes into our life, this fullness of the Holy Spirit. God wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit to empower us for ministry. Now, I have this book at home that I love so much, and it's called uh, Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians. And so I was looking at George Whitfield last night, who was a famous preacher, from England, in 1732, when he was 18, he went to Oxford. And then he was ordained and said at the moment of his ordination, Whitfield seems to have made a complete consecration of himself. That is the key. Surrendering all, not sort of, but all in. Complete consecration to God. Saying whatever, whenever, whoever, wherever, I will do whatever you want me to do, Lord. My life is yours. That's when the change happens complete consecration of himself to God, and then he received the anointing of the Spirit and power which made him so mighty a worker in God's harvest field. Then, later, says, On a Sunday morning I arose early and I prayed over St. Paul's epistle to Timothy, and more particularly over that precept, Let no man despise thy youth, because he was, he was still young. When I went up to the altar... I could think of nothing but Samuel standing as a little child before the Lord with a linen ephod, 
When the bishop laid his hands upon my head, my heart was melted down. That's what happened to me when I went down to the bottom of the theater in Santa Monica in 1986 in the vineyard in a theater on the promenade. And they laid hands on me and I just felt this heat and this electricity and I just melted under the hands of those elders. He laid his hands upon my head as my heart was melted down. I offered my whole spirit, soul, and body to the service of God's sanctuary. I read the gospel at the bishop's command with power and afterwards sealed the good confession I had made before many witnesses by partaking in the holy sacrament. That God really touched the lips of Whitfield with the divine fire of his Holy Spirit at the time of his ordination seems proved by the fact that he began to preach with great unction and power on the next Sunday after his ordination. His first sermon was delivered to an immense audience in his old home church at Gloucester. Complaint was afterwards made to the bishop that 15 people were driven mad by his sermon. 15 people were driven mad by his sermon. How does that happen? Conviction. Conviction. The good bishop replied that he hoped that madness would not be forgotten before the next Sunday. He was only 22 years of age. Bristol was completely under his spell. This is a mort someone with mortal flesh being filled with the Spirit, and suddenly when he speaks, boom, God moves. It's not George, it's the Holy Spirit. Quakers and nonconformists generally left their chapels to hear him preach. They didn't, all of a sudden, denominations weren't like a big deal. The new birth preached with power from on high seemed to attract all conditions of men. Every nook and corner of the church was crowded, and half the people had to be turned away. Many wept bitterly when he left the city, as did the people of Gloucester when he left that city. In London, while waiting for his vessel, he was compelled to preach, and the large churches would not hold his audiences. This, that, I mean, that is amazing. Thousands went away for want of room. Thousands were turned away. Chris, are you hearing this? Is this good? On Sunday, the streets were crowded with people going to meet long before the break of day. They were getting up like people do for concerts here and hang in line for church in the dark. The stewards could hardly carry the donations made for the orphanage he hoped to start in America. So heavy and so many were the large English pennies of that day which formed the bulk of the collections. Soon the clergy in town became jealous and bitter opposition set in against Whitfield and they, the churches closed their doors against him. Can you believe that? The move of God and the churches closed their doors. Well, he went to England in 1738 and began to work in cooperation with the Wesleys. John Wesley and, his, and Charles, they had started the Holiness Club, and they found methods of attaining holiness. That's where the word Methodist comes from. They had methods of attaining holiness. So he got together with the Wesleys who had been led out into the light concerning regeneration or the new birth. God was greatly blessing them, but their preaching was too plain. Whitfield preached in one church where a thousand people were unable to get inside. Can you imagine a church here in L.A. right now with a thousand people around the church trying to get in? This is a different time, and this is an extreme unction and anointing. This suggested to him the idea of outdoor preaching. This is where the outdoor preaching came, and that's what we're doing, right? But even his Methodist brethren at that time regarded this as a mad idea. Soon after this, the people were so deeply moved by his preaching, they began to say aloud amen to many things that he said. This seems to have been a new thing in those days. Excluded from the churches, and I'm almost done, Whitfield began his open-air preaching in Kingswood, Bristol in 1739. There the rough coal miners gathered to hear him, and his audiences doubled and trebled until he found himself preaching to 20,000 people. Tears streamed down the cheeks of the cold, begrimed, begrimed men, and hundreds and hundreds were convicted of sin and brought to Christ. Whitfield had now left off using printed prayers and written sermons like mine, and prayed and preached extemporaneously. He would just, the Holy Spirit would just give him what to say, boom. Maybe I should try that next week to see what happens. 
as he felt led by the Holy Spirit. Wherever he went, the people flocked to hear him in such great crowds that the churches would no longer have contained them had they had been open to him. When farewelling from Bristol, the crowd was so great at one of the Methodist societies they had to leave by mounting a ladder and climbing over the tiling of a house. This is amazing. This book I have is just full of these stories. I encourage you to read biographies to get you fired up to do things bigger than you. That requires the Holy Spirit to happen, for it to happen. And then my last part is, perhaps the greatest meeting was at Campbellslang near Glasgow, Scotland, where he is said to have preached to an audience. This is outdoors. I don't know how, I mean, that's got to be God too, his voice, right? Think about it. He preached to an audience variously estimated at from 30 to 100,000 people at one time. 100,000. That's like the LA College, you know, the Rose Bowl without a microphone. Many were bathed in tears for an hour and a half while he was preaching, and it is claimed that 10,000 persons professed conversion to Christ under this sermon. How did it happen? The Spirit within him. It's not George by George. It was the Spirit within him. So, receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 8 said to wait for the power from on high, because the Holy Spirit will come upon you and then baptize you and enable you to be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and enables you to be a witness, that's what happened to me after I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I haven't shut up since. I haven't, because the Holy Spirit anointing came on me, and whenever I start to speak, even if I'm tired or whatever, I feel the Holy Spirit come up and quicken me, right, to do what I do. If you knew me from my days in Texas, you would be astonished or whatever just for the difference because I was just a chill, stony surfer guy that got lit by the Holy Spirit, right? Just watching the world go by. I had no goals, no dreams, just day at a time. Didn't help me much. So, it's 9.57, and I'm, I just got to point six, which is really good. And I don't think I have time for it. So I want to stop right there, and I'll go to point six next week. Because... This is a good day to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? There's the initial encounter with the Lord where the Holy Spirit draws us in. And we feel that drawing. We feel the conviction of our sin. And many of us cried and cried and cried. And then we repented. We said, I'm sorry, Lord, for my sin. And I don't know, my wife and I, we cried for like several months when we went to Hope Chapel the whole time we were worshiping. That's all we did is cry through worship. Because we just felt the weight of our sin and then the joy of being forgiven. He who is forgiven much loves much. He who is forgiven much loves much, right? So ever since that time, my experience in, in Santa Monica in 1986, I've been encouraged to being kept, being filled with the Spirit. And that's point number six. So for those of you that do have the Holy Spirit, that's the advanced cliff notes on point number six. Every day, pray, read the Word, play Christian music, watch things, listen to things, do things that are going to fill you with His Holy Spirit. It says in 2 Timothy 1.3, fan into flame the gift of God that's been given to you through the laying on of hands. It's not just going to happen.